Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Elliott. I'm with Kentucky Office of Rural Health. I want to thank everyone for coming out for the third and final uh, webinar series that we are putting on, uh, Building Morale and Motivation Within Your Crew. Uh, we've had two previous good speakers with Chris and Mike. Uh, we want to thank them again. Uh, today, we're going to have Dr. Jay Fitch uh, with Fitch & Associates. Uh, he's going to talk about improving our EMS organization's teamwork, morale, and culture. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jay now. Well, good afternoon. Uh, you know, I'm honored to be uh, one of the three presenters this week. Uh, I was one of the early medics trained in the United States and have never forgotten uh, some of what uh, everybody on the field goes through. And I'm going to just kind of warn you in advance today, you're going to probably need pen and paper uh, as we go through a couple of things today. And I would invite you to make any comments or ask specific questions as we go. Um, you know, teamwork, morale, and culture, they, they were important to me as an EMT. They were important to me as a medic and as a director. But as we think about it, it's kind of elusive and kind of like grabbing a cloud. Here's a real brief, whimsical example of why teamwork in all aspects of what we do is important. Well, that's not wanting to let me do that. Now, take just a moment and list four or five of the most important behaviors that demonstrate a coworker's commitment to teamwork. Take a minute. You know, some of my answers, uh, you can post them in the chat if you like. Some of my answers were a good team member is open to change. They focus on how to make it better. Uh, they have a sense of humor and uh, build people up rather than tear them down. They're quick to offer assistance. And if they have conflicts, they talk to the person, not about the person. And last, they acknowledge others, treating others with kindness and respect. Likewise, take a second here and enlist some signs of poor team attitudes. Well, I don't know about your list, but my list includes people who do as little as possible, colleagues that are judgmental and gossip, those that flaunt strong technical skills over less experienced uh, or skilled workers, colleagues, but people who are defensive, hostile, unwilling to perform, or uh, forcing others to pick up the slack. They uh, hide, dump, and complain. And, uh, you know, it's one of the comments is it's all about me. Yeah. You know, in many respects, the fundamental attitudes can be traced back to our worldview or perceptions. And perception is reality. If, uh, you know, our view of the situation can be that life is hard in EMS because you will experience loss and death. And frankly, we all know we're not that important and we're certainly not in control. But in contrast, if our worldview is that life and saving lives is exhilarating, that in that process we experience growth and blessings and that we in fact do impact those with whom we interact and work and that we get to shape our own experiences, then we function from the place of knowing that our attitude, not our aptitude, controls our career altitude. So 
be for your first test, take that sheet of paper, and the test is I need you to write your alphabet vertically along the margin. So write your alphabet vertically along the margin. I'm going to give you some words that will help you build morale and inspire leadership in your organization. So here we go. The A stand, you know, it's, it's really, if you look at the, the cartoon, it's hard to conduct a symphony this way, and it's hard to work in an EMS environment that doesn't think about morale or when everybody has their back turned. To get your team to face the right way, let's think about these words. The A stands for active two-way communications. The B in our alphabet stands for building others up. If you lift people up, they'll never let you down. Let's say that again, it's so important. If we lift others up, they won't let us down. The C stands for uh, conflict management. Uh, most of us in the EMS don't like conflict, and um, so we avoid it. D stands for diplomacy, knowing when and how to say things to influence others. The E stands for empowering or helping others learn and grow in their career. Um, the F stands for fair. Now that means really treating people equitably, not equally. Uh, probably uh, the best example of that is I have two daughters, one that played rugby for the University of Kentucky rugby team when she was in college, and the other who was Broadway bound and a thespian. And the, my rugby player would speak in four letter words and I sometimes had to shout to get her to listen. And if I raised my voice to the, my other daughter, she was in tears, so I had to learn to treat them equitably if I was gonna be fair for, with them. The G in our alphabet stands for grateful. And expressing gratitude every day is one of the best things you can do, one of the best things you can do for your own mental health. And the H stands for being humble, because being humble is one of the best things you can do for others' mental health. Integrity, well, it's not really a competency. It's more about your character. And uh, you can't build morale if you, aren't an, have, if you don't have integrity as, a, as an individual within the organization. The J stands for just culture. Most of you know that just culture is related to systems thinking, which emphasizes things are generally a product of organizational systems rather than just a mistake that an individual makes. So we don't tend to punish individuals for organizational failures. Unfortunately, often in EMS, we want to try to blame anybody we can uh, to, to get after what, uh, what may have happened. The K stands for kindness, and kindness always wins the day, and, and that's particularly true during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The L stands for listening skills. We have to listen loudly and talk softly. The M in our alphabet so stands for mission focused. Remember that we're part of a sacred profession and we need to stay true to our mission. The N has to do with nurturing. We, we are teachers as we move through the process of serving. The O stands for being optimistic. Uh, nobody likes being around Debbie or Donnie Downer. Uh, and so the best way to be optimistic is you have to be positive. Uh, that's the P word, positive. Catch people doing something right, reinforce the behavior that you want rather than the negatives. The Q stands for quality focused and um, quality must flow into every corner of what we do in, in EMS. The R stands for respectful. When I first met my wife, I asked her, why is it that everybody likes you? And she said, just simply, well, I try to respect others and treat everybody with kindness and respect. And I find that 99% of the folks that I do that with treat me the same way. The S stands for self-aware. You know, we all know people who don't have a clue uh, about how, um, about themselves. Some of you who know me really well know that uh, after my father died a number of years ago, my mother took a two-year appointment at age 72 as a missionary to Thailand. And when I asked her about six months in, what have you learned? She said, she said, well, I learned that I'm really not the center of the universe and that every person on this earth has a story. And I didn't realize that. 
So when we're dealing with folks, if we want to build morale and inspire others and do a great job in EMS, we have to remember to be self-aware. The T stands for be a team builder. You can't do it by yourself. And the U stands for being unbiased. You know, that's, that's when we come to things and have to make decisions, keep an open mind. The V stands for visionary. The W stands for welcoming. A lot of the organizations uh, in Kentucky, they have open door policies. You have open door policies. But are you feel, do you feel welcomed when you walk through that door? The X stands for extraordinary, because extraordinary results are possible if we build the morale and teamwork in our organizations. The Y stands for yearning to learn or simply desire. The Z stands for zealous. We have to be a zealot for patients and for our caregivers. Now, there are some, here are my top 10 major failure points that we also need to be aware of morale in our organizations. We do have a lot of drama in EMS, and so we really need to think about not tolerating that drama, whether it's from a partner or whether it's from a crew member or from a boss. We often will postpone tough conversations, but you know, it's been my experience that things don't get better over time, and we really need to have those tough conversations with folks. The third major failure point is that we'll come to a conclusion without explaining the why. And particularly with millennials that we work with in EMS organizations today, they want to know why. They want to know the why. Fourth uh, failure point is speaking during the heat of emotion. Uh, that'll get you divorced, despised, or even dismissed at work. So think about not taking that moment, taking the deep breath, and I have to work on this myself because I want to just pop an answer out real quick, and sometimes I have to just slow it down. The fifth failure point is uh, blaming others rather than accepting personal responsibility. If you come from the attitude that, that gee, um, I'm sorry, or this, I shouldn't have let this happen, uh, rather than blaming, rather than doing this routine, blaming anybody else. Um, you know, when we have three shifts, it was always the fourth shift that, that put the dent in the fender, um, rather than just owning up to it. Sixth is creating and condoning complexity. You know, there are times that those in our organizations want to make things so hard that nobody could figure it out because that then becomes their own power base. Uh, Seventh, unfulfilled promises. You've got to always tell the truth. Eighth is avoiding reasonable risks. Now, there, there, we, we work in a risky environment, but there are reasonable risks that we need to take. And if we're afraid to, to step out and do anything, uh, it's going to be a failure point in terms of building morale. Ninth, if you're a leader, hiding in the office doesn't work very much. And tenth is forgetting to say thank you. You do! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land where maybe we can find some self confidence for you, you jack wagon! Yeah, we building culture really has to involve having some empathy, but we also have to think about. Um, Coma. You know, all of us know that clinically, coma is defined as an abnormal deep stupor occurring in illness or as a result of trauma. Uh, patients who are comatose are generally unable to communicate and their vital systems become slow and eventually shut down, resulting in death. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody on uh, the webinar today, but some of those same coma descriptors can be used to describe how some of us act in our own relationships or how our organizations can be perceived. Unresponsive, unable to communicate with vital systems shutting down. And that results in clinical accountability issues. You know what they are. 
operational infarctions of our systems, morale atrophy, and certainly administrative and teamwork anemia. So if we really want to avoid these conditions, then we have to think about how we're going to lead within our organizations. And one of my premises is that everybody is a leader because it's not a title, it's an action. Now, in the Gallup book profiled over on the right, uh, titled 12 Elements of Great Managing, it's interesting to note that five of the 12 factors are related to development at work. That includes the opportunity to do what I do best, recognition and praise, people encouraging development, everybody in the organization talking about the progress toward the goals and having opportunities to learn and grow within the organization. Those are ways we get motivated. Um, you know, pop up in the, uh, in the chat block for a second, if you would, things that mo positively motivate you. I'm going to take a minute while some of you type some things in there. It's interesting that the Gallup factors uh, with really correlate highly to the work of Daniel Pink. And he's written a number of books entitled, uh, including uh, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And one of the things that Pink advocates um, is that what really motivates people at work are autonomy, mastery over my chosen work, and meaningful purpose. I think it's on all three of those because we tend to work in an autonomous environment. Yeah, we have protocols, but we're out among, you know, doing that work, we're not under close supervision mastery or being extraordinarily competent at the skills that we perform and having meaningful purpose. I think it's really um, amazing to think about we, you know, the purpose that we have. And some of the comments we're talking about teamwork and making, you know, working together to accomplish a goal. Uh, Danny, thank you for that. Um, I think it's, it's really critically important. Now, our research has led to, to us to think about research within EMS organizations really key that drive discretionary performance and improved morale. And looking at that, those include identification with the culture and the climate within your organization. You know, the second is probably one of the most important absolutely most important is the relationship with the leader of the organization. People don't quit organizations. The research tells us that people quit leaders. So if you're a leader on the webinar, pay attention. Also has to do with relationships with our colleagues. I spent a year one month with a partner that I just could not stand and had a terrible relationship and it actually impacted my morale, but it also impacted collectively impacted our care. I couldn't wait to get away from that individual. Um, you know, the fourth factor has to do with our job role and content, that there's some variety and challenge in the job. Uh, we, they have to be a good match for the person's desire for autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Because if you're a person that really doesn't want to work in an autonomous environment, uh, and you need direction every moment, EMS may not be the best place for you, and it's going to be hard for you to stay motivated. Fifth is the clear link to where the job fits into the wider organization. Uh, some of you who were with Mike Tagman yesterday know that he works for an organization called First Watch, and uh, the CEO of that organization is Todd Stout, and I had the great good fortune to be one of the leaders in an organization that Todd worked in when he was 16 as a stock person. He was the logistics person. And I asked him one day, I said, Todd, why you do your job so magnificently? Uh, why is it so important to you? And he said, Jay, if, if I don't do my job well, the medics and the EMTs, they're going to not be able to take care of the patients because they're not going to have what they need out in the field. So 
being able to link where that person fits into the overall organization mission is really important. Sixth is we have to have the ability to offer ideas, suggestions, and challenge, um, and, and to speak out really to dissent constructively. Because one of the things that's a real motiva motivation killer is if you can't talk with others in the organizations about things that you don't like, as long as you do it constructively, I think it's really important. And, and certainly the seventh item has to do with clarity of expectations. You know, when I think one of the EMS's epic fails is that we, uh, we start people into this career uh, and they go through their EMT and paramedic training and they expect to go out and heal the sick and raise the dead. And instead uh, they have grandma puking on their shoes. And so the expectations of what the job really is needs to be pretty clear right from the beginning. When uh, we think about toxic cultures are really another factor that can uh, um, influence organization morale. Now, Mr. Burns, he, he had a 30 year run as uh, being a horrible boss on the Simpsons and the evil, devious, greedy and wealthy owner of the Springfield nuclear plant had quite a reputation. And, and many of us have worked for a Mr. Burns at some point or have been a Mr. Burns and uh, his reputation is probably one that not many of us really want to share. Now, to change culture, to change the culture in an organization, um, we really have to, if you can't read the caption, it says, uh, uh, good work, but I think we need a little more work right here. We have to be intentional, even though we want it to happen miraculously, it doesn't. And so there are eight fundamental ways that we have to try to improve our organizational culture and move it to a good state. And those eight ways include activity, ownership of processes or buy-in, power, sharing power, affiliation, focusing on competence rather than arrogance, and encouraging achievement. Seventh is recognition, and eighth is showing the meaning of work. And let's, let's look a little bit deeper into each one of those. You know, the first three are ownership and power. If we think about creating different levels of activity, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean more post moves, guys. Uh, it means engaging both the left and right side of our brain. You know, if we're, um, you know, active and fun and varying work assignments. Uh, as a medic, I was assigned to serve on a number of external committees uh, when I was early in my career. And, and that really uh, was an act really important. So let's see, how do we make work fun? Well, it's not making fun of our patients and it's not using nitrous between calls. Uh, but uh, one of the most uh, interesting fun activities I've heard of this week uh, during EMS week was one organization that had a photo scavenger hunt um, to celebrate EMS week uh, to, to have fun with the crews. So the second big cornerstone here has to do with creating ownership and um, asking for input, giving caregivers a stake in the success and letting them make choices. I remember uh, as a director in Kansas City, we were getting ready to, to get a whole new fleet of ambulances. And I, it's really one of the, the neat opportunities to say, look, here's what we can spend on the unit. We have to meet state specifications, um, but I want you to design this unit. I don't care if the stretcher's on the left or on the right, or, you know, it could be on the roof. Well, that wouldn't meet the specifications, but people work together and they had ownership in the ambulances. And actually, interesting side story is that one of the few fist fights I ever had uh, um, as, as a director had to do with when one of those new ambulances came in and uh, one of the new EMTs who hadn't been part of the process kind of trashed it out one day throwing McDonald's wrappers around. And one of the medics picked him up by the scruff of the neck and said, 
that's my ambulance. Don't screw with it again. Uh, clean that stuff up because that person had ownership. So the third piece here has to do with uh, sharing power by giving responsibility um, to people for their work and providing leadership opportunities. Uh, you know, that could be anything from writing protocols to doing all kinds of things uh, that the organization needs done. But and it's not, I'm not talking about meaningless stuff. I'm talking about stuff that really uh, is important things. You know, we worked on, uh, had a, uh, we had a lot of committees um, and we paid people for that time when they were, you know, functioning. We were on the committee helping redo our radio system and working on different kinds of protocols. That was really all about sharing power. At the end of the day, it's about sharing power. So our fourth piece here has to do with affiliation. Caregivers need to feel like they belong. And uh, you know we build affiliation with work-related socializing. Well, maybe not so much during uh, COVID-19, but that can be um, team sports. It can be anything that uh, uses the power and harnesses the power of teamwork. We think about encouraging competence, individuals' hidden strengths, and um, you know, provide them learning opportunities. We, we tolerate mistakes, and we use objective performance measures. You know, it's what I've found is that when I put the performance measures out there and share them with folks, and they can see the, the, how they do in relation to that particular measure, they will work incredibly hard to make sure that the measure gets met because they want to achieve. You know, achievement involves uh, uh, helping folks set some of their own goals. And I found that when I let caregivers set their own goals, they were almost always higher than the goals that I would arbitrarily set. And that also encourages caregivers to stretch their limits. So we need to encourage folks to recognize their caregivers, other caregivers with appreciation and showing that the work has meaning. You know, um, we are in a sacred profession. And so it's absolutely critical, it's absolutely critical that we think about this in a different way. Eight different strategies that you can use with about a dozen little ideas. So let me stop for just a second and, and ask you to pop up. What are a couple of other ideas that I haven't mentioned that you think will help leaders build morale? Salary, increasing, increasing pay is probably not one of those, but I mean, that's one we'd all, that's the miracle that we'd all like to have happen, but probably won't. So pop up a couple of other thoughts that, that we haven't shared so far. This is the part where you get to participate. Well, it's kind of a quiet group, so I'm gonna go on. Oh, working together to accomplish that goal, okay? Always under promise and over deliver. That's another way to encourage and develop morale. Thank you for that, Chuck. Um, there's some more coming in. Let me just stop and value others' opinions. Those are great, great thoughts from Somerset Pulaski EMS. Good, good thoughts there. Well, let me ask you another question. So, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference between motivation and inspiration? Motivation and inspiration. Anybody got some ideas for me? Well, I think of motivation as lighting a fire under somebody. It's really external to that person. It's pushing them to get the job done. Whereas I think of 
inspiration as lighting a fire within someone and pulling them toward uh, a po more positive culture. Now my hope to you is, or hope for you is that um, as we think about building morale within our organizations that we uh, pull caregivers toward our leadership. Now, you know, we're running a little bit ahead here. So I'm going to, again, ask you to start thinking about, see, I, I got so excited here. I forgot to even advance uh, the slide. So motivation, lighting a fire under someone and inspiration is lighting a fire within someone, under someone and within someone. So one of the things that I want to do is take, I, I reserved a whole lot of time here um, to think about some questions that you might want to ask that I might be able to help answer. And so I'm going to pause and again, ask you to be a little more active and punch some things up with specific questions here that I can respond to. And then I'll have a couple more thoughts um, as we go, but let me get a couple questions from, from those of you on the webinar. While you're doing that, let me move on to a couple more things. Um, you know, um, motivation of different age groups. Yeah, it, it is uh, interesting. Thank you for that question, Chuck. Um, we, different generations, in fact, are uh, motivated by different folks. I think when we think about the generational factors, um, folks who are senior in their career uh, or have been in their career for a time, they really want stability and want to be, uh, think about, you know, as they're moving, thinking about retirement, um, you know, so their thought processes are quite different from millennials. Millennials as I said, you know, we, we millennials have taken a lot of, have been bashed a lot about how they don't care. Well, I don't believe that that's true. I think they do care. I think part of what we as uh, in organizations have to understand is that we have to meet people where they live. And that means in, in many respects, um, understanding what may float the other person's boat. And so thinking about what motivates individuals. So it's not just within age groups, but it could be about individual people. One of the things is early in my career, um, you know, the director that I worked for knew that I wanted an education. And so, you know, he helped me um, move toward that goal, but and said, I will give you some preferential scheduling, I will work with you uh, for some tuition reimbursement as long as you become an example uh, of what being a great medic uh, means and help reinforce uh, what, what this organization stands for. And so that motivated me because uh, he understood what was important to me. Uh, and I think so many of us, as we think about motivation today, we've really got to get it down to individuals and, and where they are. And Mike Pointer just put up a great question too about uh, dealing with people that always complain about everything. You know, as I said, nobody wants to be around Debbie and Donnie Downer uh, and, or, or, you know, the complainers of the world. So part of what I've found to be helpful with those folks is really been to say to them directly, so give me a positive idea. Tell me something instead of complaining here, come, come forward with an idea and let's think about this together. And sometimes actually even sending them back with an assignment as we're talking about that issue, a particular issue to say, would, you know, while you're on duty next, next time and you've got some time between calls, I'd like you to really go out and, and do some internet research and tell me about this particular complaint or this particular problem and come back with two or three different ideas 
that we could address how we how we in this organization today given our limited resources and given the political reality of the you know the county commissioners or our, our board not wanting to do but you know and spend a lot of money what we could do and again it's that ownership it's it's involving getting people engaged in a different way uh, that really helps um, get them out of the fact that because if I'm just a complainer and you let me complain all the time, what really happens is that you're taking the monkey off their back and they're putting it on your back. And so then the next version of that is, well, I told so-and-so about that and they didn't do anything about it. So your leadership gets maligned because you failed to solve the problem. So I think part of the, the answer here has to be involved with everybody being involved in solving a particular problem or particularly what they're complaining about. Somebody else got a question. All right, keep coming, keep coming. I'm gonna flip around for a minute and while you're thinking of a couple more questions, cause I really, I wanna be interactive here and respond to your questions. Uh, leading remote teams, thank you, Paul, for that question. What, how do we do that? Well, I think it is, you have to be physically present to do that. So even though people are remote, you know, if we're going to motivate them, we motivate people by being with them and leading from the front lines. And, and to do that, we have to stay connected. I'm, I, I think in reality, the less time we spend in our offices or less time we spend in our ivory towers, as some might say, would have to do with, being there, just having a cup of coffee, just sitting down and going, Hey, uh, what's on your mind? You know, what are, what are some things that have gone really well for you in the last three shifts? And that's the way you lead and reinforce the positive. It also helps deal with the complainers by asking those specific questions that require people to focus on positive things, but you can't lead an EMS organization remotely. You have to be there. You have to be, you know, reach out to folks and, and work with them. Morgan, uh, thank you for the question about mentoring future leaders. You know, part of the reason that EMS struggles so much uh, is that we don't, we don't encourage people uh, to lead. We don't teach people how to lead. You know, most of us, you know, come to, um, supervisory roles because we were good clinicians and you know we got bumped up into being a supervisor that certainly happened to me um, I was a, a, well I won't say I was a great clinician but I was a good clinician and so they the leadership thought well let's make them a supervisor and a lead medic and that really didn't uh, work um, near near as well um, so it, it, um, mentoring our leaders as we've got to give them the opportunity to demonstrate their hidden talents. So, um, now Chuck, your question here about field staff, how do you engage your leaders, um, and pause to provide positive information? Well, one of the ways is a, one of the great ways. Thank you for that. We do do some, uh, remote management of different kinds of programs like the University Medical Center in Lubbock, Texas. And one of the things that's really um, about remote teams is that we manage up and we would encourage, like when I'm getting ready to go to uh, out to Texas as, as a leader, one of the things that we, we do um, is I'll, I'll ask uh, Thomas Moore, uh, who's the director of that program, hey Thomas, what are some of the, the most interesting, tell me about things that have gone really well and who did them so that when I encounter those people, I can talk about the call that they had done or the contribution that they'd made. And what that really does is it, it uh, in fact, uh, not only re reinforces positively that individual's action, but it reinforces the fact that their leader or their remote leader um, 
communicated that to me, that I've communicated it back. And so, you know, how do you suggest change to upper management? And part of that is you got to do it uh, carefully um, and think about the egos that are involved because, uh, you know, we sometimes have uh, senior leaders that, that don't want to hear it, but we have to, if we're going to be a contributor within the organization, we have to be true and we have to speak truth to power. That doesn't mean we have to be a jerk about it, but we really have to think about the ways that um, we can say things that are important. And the way that, that are best to phrase things is to phrase it from a positive, boss, I know that you have, you've given a lot of your life to this organization and, and not say but, but say, and one of the concerns that I've got is about the direction that we're going with this particular um, protocol or this, whatever the specific may be, but to phrase it positively to begin with so that you're tying that person's commitment to what needs to, to uh, move forward. Now dealing with gossip and, and, and rumors, kill them. You know, um, the best way to deal with gossip and rumors is to make sure that the facts are out there from you as a leader, that you don't wait for the gossip, uh, you know, to, to happen. And when you hear it, you address it. One of the things that when we're dealing with an organization in the midst of a, a change process is that we would often uh, think about, you know, putting together even a Q and A that goes out almost every couple of weeks so that if we hear things that might be on the rumor mill, that we address them, we answer them. We don't give it a chance to, to kind of rumble around in the organization. So I think that's one of the best ways to deal with rumors. And then there are times, if I've got a person that's a rumor monger, I may come, actually, I wouldn't bring them into my office, but I might show up at their station and say, gosh, you know, it seems like, you know, I'm hearing a lot of stuff and, Ask me, ask me directly if there's a question uh, or you've got a question so that we can do it. You know, you know, while you continue to think about some questions, I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues related specifically to COVID-19 that we're dealing with right now that, that impact our morale. You know, we know that members of our profession carry a really heavy emotional burden uh, every day. Um, but during COVID-19, I think we've had uh, a real struggle uh, with, with trying to keep people motivated and the thought process. I, I talked to a provider last week who, who uh, told me how difficult it's been um, as they've dealt with COVID-19 patients that when the family members knew that they wouldn't be allowed to visit at the hospital, um, they were saying goodbye in the back of the ambulance and and that wasn't something that the caregiver was really prepared for. And so we really have to be thoughtful about what people are going through um, because that, that is a morale, morale killer to think about. Um, we, above and beyond the normal things that we deal with. And something else I think to be mindful about is that beyond our own uh, 911 and EMS workforce, it's pretty clear that COVID-19 has exacerbated what, what I'll refer to as deaths of despair. Um, a recent study from the Robert Graham Center showed that high levels of stress, isolation, and economic stress during the pandemic may cause an additional 75,000 deaths from suicide, drugs, and alcohol. And if the economic recovery is a bit slower, it could, uh, that number could double. And, you know, certainly coming out of uh, South Carolina, there's the, their, uh, the Medical University of South Carolina is just in the midst of a study about how uh, drug use and uh, particularly opioid use has skyrocketed during COVID-19. So not that, uh, so we have to be thoughtful about what our people are going through in this, in this time. And it, I got to tell you that um, one of uh, this year's uh, very talented ASM students who suffered from post-traumatic stress issues related to being involved in 
the Las Vegas mass shooting several years ago. Um, as COVID-19 unfolded, it triggered some of his demons and he committed suicide. And I was told that, you know, the stress of facing COVID-19 affected him deeply, affected his morale. And, and it, guys, it, it gets real when someone you know, someone you work with, or someone you love takes their life. So we have to think about the current environment that our people are, are living through um, to be, and be thoughtful about that because it, this is a time when it's tough to keep morale, to keep morale up. So one of the things that, that uh, we're kind of going back to one of the other questions about what, what should we do? Um, I like to ask and encourage people to ask questions. And so one of the questions I like to ask um, is what needs to be done? If you ask the question, hey, what needs to be done in this organization? It helps us understand the belly button center of the universe theory. And that is, uh, that theory says that yours isn't the center of the universe. So um, you have to look around, you have to be perceptive, and you have to ask questions. I've always found that, that even as a consultant, when I, when I go, well, that's interesting, tell me why that's important. Or whenever I can ask an open-ended question, it really helps people come forward with their ideas and that really improves people's morale and teamwork. So the second really critical question, so if the first one is what needs to be done, the second one I like to ask, and I think that you should ask is, how can I create value in this situation? Because no matter where you find yourself, how do I create value? And if I really want to be a service to the team, I'm gonna seek out an unfulfilled need and fill it. And that could be thinking about a different way to do logistics. It could be thinking about all kinds of different things. It's how do I create value? Hmm, that's going to be a positive. And the third, which we've talked and touched on previously, really has to do with how do I empower others? You know, you've got to be positive. You've got to be enjoyable. Um, leaders that fly high do that in part because of their own willingness to take themselves lightly. You know, I would encourage all of you in the organization to be amazed. And that's the awe factor of, you know, um, I'm, I'm sometimes it's, it's jaw dropping to me to see the staff or the team's capacity to care. And I think that's really, really important. So be thankful and celebrate. You know, the, it's, it's just amazing to me uh, some of the, the ways we can do that. And part of that's just keeping our own life as leaders simple. You know, um, and that means pretty much remaining pretty ordinary. Um, always, it's always interesting to me that Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, he uh, lives almost in the same house that he lived in 50 years ago. Um, you got to stay in touch with yourself and cultivate humility. Um, downplay your pridefulness. That's going to really help build the morale of others. But if you're trying to build your own morale a little bit, remind yourself of what really matters in life. And that's important as well. Um, one of the things that I've, that's often helped me build morale in the organizations that I've worked with is to kind of keep it light, shine a light on my own fo foibles. Um, I can screw stuff up pretty easily, pretty quickly. And uh, I like to, to acknowledge when I've screwed it up. And, uh, you know, that, that's been uh, helpful by illum illuminating my own flaws, but never illuminating others. Um, and when it comes to humor, always using self-depreciating humor um, that communicates vulnerability rather than, than is offensive. So, you know, I, I think as we think about morale and teamwork, you know, I like to float trial balloons, little balloons that, of, of ideas, sometimes wild ideas that uh, uh, people come back and say, you know, that really was, if you do that, if we do that, that's going to be really crazy. So they, by floating trial balloons, 
it has a multiple effect. One, it engages people within the organization and, and can improve their morale. And two, it can save your bacon if you've thought about something that's really silly um, to, to implement. Um, so one of the other things that I think really can help a leader build morale within the organization is for you to reflect more, not less. You know, um, sometimes as leaders, we don't have um, a solid understanding of ourselves. And, and so it's really important for us to begin to, to reflect. And certainly last but not least is uh, uh, look up, keep looking up. Um, because if you look down uh, and you get down, it's, it's, it can be pretty tough. Uh, that that uh, applies, I'm, a, I'm an avid horse person as well. And uh, so whenever I get into tough terrain, if I start to look over the edge of the cliff, you know, it's not a good thing. And so I look up and look forward and that's, that's really important. So as we start to wrap up here, um, it's, it's really important that uh, you understand that you're remembered for the weight of your character, for the unique marks of your accomplishments, for the shape of your kindness, for the length of your stride in doing the right thing, for the depth of your compassion, and for the width of your personal warmth, generosity, values, and your ability to listen. Improving morale in your organization, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's clear, but it's hard to see. And even when we see what's needed, it's sometimes pretty difficult to do. You know, I'm gonna encourage you to communicate with, all, with three distinct senses, hearing, feeling, and smelling. Well, that smelling is really the intuition. Uh, you don't wanna smell a medic. So let's, let's think about smelling as intuition. Um, and in the example that you see on the screen, if we're hearing, we're hearing the rhythmic waves, we're feeling the sand between our toes, and we're smelling the breeze. And if you only experienced one of those dimensions, the experience isn't bad. But if you experience and perceive all three dimensions, it really enhances your experience exponentially. So, when you're improving the morale in your organizations, you're leaving behind positive imprints. And when you do that, you enhance the lives of everybody around you, other leaders, our peers, our followers, and our families. We give them footprints to follow when they've lost their way. Now being thoughtful about morale and culture is one of the ways you're gonna leave a legacy of footprints to the future. With that, let me simply add on a personal note that uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful uh, to be part of this profession for now more than I, <laughs> 50 years, uh, starting at 16, and uh, to be one of your colleagues. Uh, I wanna thank you during the CMS week for what you do and who you are as you do it. Back to you, Scott. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out this week during the EMS uh, webinar series. Uh, this is about you, uh, about EMS in Kentucky. Uh, always remember that Kentucky Office of Rural Health is here for anybody that needs help with anything. Um, so that concludes this series. And, and thank you for everything that you all do for Kentucky. <laughs>